Hi, welcome to the Mana Plane development vlog. Here you can see the Mana Plane. This is a game entirely ray traced and made in GLSL that runs on your GPU or whatever OpenGL processor you have. In this video today, you're going to get to watch the progression and development of the Mana Plane. Hi, so I've already actually started the Mana Plane development. I decided I wanted to do this dev blog a little bit late. I'd already started doing a bunch of the programming here, so I'm just going to go through and I'm going to explain what I already have. I'll show and I'll run the game here. As you can see, I have this map, star skybox, uh, and these pillars. I've got a basic physics system where I can walk around them. See, I can fall in between the gaps. So I've just sort of set up the basics of the game a physics engine where I can walk around and control the player. So this game's being being made in GLSL, so it's it's a bit different than a normal game. Uh, if you see here, we have game logic texture pointers. These are like hard fixed pointers of where the data is stored for our game, and all of our game is stored in this game logic texture which computes the new state of the game every frame. So the whole game runs in GLSL in a frame buffer. And the next, uh, the state of the game is calculated using the fragment shader code. So here in this uh, constants, uh, we have layers here. I guess I'll first of all explain, this is GLSL Canvas. This, uh, this app I'm using is an app I made called GLSL Canvas. It's for editing GLSL shaders in the browser, and you can just run them and have mouse input. And it also actually lets you export them as a standalone game or standalone app. So that's what we're gonna be doing with this when we're done. Anyways, uh, it splits it into layers. So this layer zero game code is a shared layer that this code is shared with all the other layers. So in this game logic layer, you can imagine the game code is actually there above it when it generates the code. So this game code here is our constants and general shared code that is used between all the other layers. Game logic here is where the actual game state is calculated. And if you see here, we have a collision function that calculates if a sphere is colliding with any of the world geometry. And in our main function here, this is actually where it computes the game and updates the game. So you can he see here on the first frame, we initialize the game. And this has the initial states uh, of all these pointers or all of these uh, variables. So if you see here to update the game, the pixel is used to calculate a variable ID. So whatever the pixel X position is, that's the variable ID. And uh, depending on that variable ID, we update a different variable. So we've got the player state, which I haven't done yet. The player body, this is the player's physics, and this is pretty much all I've done. So you can see here, we do the movement input where we take the key, the arrow keys, and we convert them to a three-dimensional vector. We rotate this relative to the player look position, uh, and then we move the player forward scaled by the delta time, or move the player forward by this value scaled by the delta time. Then we check for collisions, and if the player hits anything, we solve the collision by pushing the player back from the collision. Uh, this is pretty standard, like you'd see in pretty much any other game engine. This, uh, especially this part, this is pretty much how you do it in another game engine like Unity. Uh, but instead of doing this manually, you would do like vector three forward, etc. All right, so that has our basic movement and gravity. One of the next things I'm going to be doing is jumping. You can't jump right now. You can only move around. So then I have the player look. And this is just moving around the player look based off the mouse position or movement. That's what lets us uh, turn the camera like this and look up and down. And then after 
running this and calculating the next state, it just outputs the next state to the pixel color. So if you can see it, it works a bit differently than a normal game, but uh, effectively it is the same. If anything, you could just consider this more multi-threaded than a normal game because each of these variable states can only output to each pixel is a vector for, and you can only write to one of those pixels at a time. So it is a bit limited in what it can do. You can never output one big batch of data. Uh, you need to split it into a whole bunch of smaller computations, but uh, it is kind of fun to write a game this way. So then finally we have our display. This is where it renders the game. This is the most of what I've done so far. Um, to start, we have a Voronoi pattern that's used for the background. That's actually this white, this white pattern here. I'm gonna try to turn that into what looks like a galaxy. It's not quite there yet. Then the background, we have our star field, the white dots, and the Voronoi. Normal here is used to calculate the normal from the world geometry used for shading, and we have ambient occlusion for shading the geometry again. This uh, number font here is, this is something I wrote previously. It's a uh, low resolution font that can be used to just easily output numbers. I'm probably gonna use this to output the player's score, but it's also really useful just to have right now for debugging. If you ever wanna see like what a variable is in GLSL, you don't have printf or you don't have any real debugging, so you have to do something like this where you output the value as actual font pixels. All right, so then finally we have the rendering here. We load in the player data because we're rendering from the player's perspective. We put the view camera ray starting from the player's uh, body position. We rotate the camera view based off your look angle. Then we ray march the... Uh, the world geometry until we find a hit and once we find a hit we get the normal and I did a little uh, procedural checkerboard texture here just to start to do some to do some shading so basically when we find a hit we just do some simple shading with ambient occlusion and the normal and then if there is no hit we display the background so uh, there we go that's that's what I have so far I wish I started this dev dev blog a bit earlier because it would be way easier to explain this as I went. Okay, so the first thing to do jumping is we need to detect when the player is on the ground. So I'm just going to detect when the bottom sphere of the player is colliding something and then I'm going to set a grounded flag to true. And then we check if it's grounded and if the player presses the spacebar or our jump key then we're going to add to the Y velocity. And that's all we need for simple jumping. So now we can see the player can jump, but this has some bugs. As you can see, they can jump super high in the air off adding to the Y velocity, and you can jump off edges. So to fix this, we're gonna check if the collision Y normal is you know, above a threshold. And using that, the player won't be able to jump off side walls. They'll only be able to jump off the ground. As you can see here, we can't propel ourselves up anymore. Now I've started working on the map. So we just have a straight walkway, and I, I've started messing with making it out of some repeating shapes, some cylinders, and some spheres. Just sort of uh, testing out what I want to do with the map. I, I, I wasn't really sure at the beginning. Uh, just started messing around with different shapes seeing what I thought looked good. Um, my original idea was to basically have some random shapes making up the walkway. So, like, like it was formed out of a straight walkway, but varied and had holes. So you can start to see here, I started putting holes in it with some spheres, and then I started randomizing it and varying them. But uh, I, I wasn't really happy with this, so I started... Uh, I started messing with twisting the bridge, and I ran into this weird bug where you can see at the edges, the background is covered by this uh, black tunnel or like cylinder. 
and I wasn't really sure what this was, so I started I started debugging, uh, marking it green where it's rendering the background, so I saw that this wasn't bug with the background or anything. I started messing with the distance function here and got, got a very interesting result. Uh, I was looking at this and going, man, this could be... This could be a game in itself, just exploring these uh, weird, distorted spaces. Uh, this sort of stuff you can't really do easily in like a normal triangle rasterizer-based game. This is something that's like, this is where ray tracing shines, I think. You can see some interesting effects you get here. So yeah, I started doing more debugging of the ray tracing function. I found I found another distance function here of changing the box distance function fixed it. And this was just a simple max abs distance function that didn't use length or square root. Uh, so I started debugging here. This didn't really uncover anything, but w what I realized was is the length and square root runs into precision issues. So when I'm looking at that edge of the tunnel, it's actually ray tracing outward and it ends up running into precision issues where it thinks the bridge is there because the length and square root functions run into their precision limits. So as you can see here, I lowered the view distance and it actually reduced it and I was like, oh yeah, that's that's because it stops it from stepping as far and hitting that tunnel. So I realized how to fix that and I moved on to making more of the map here. I did some repeating boxes, I did some repeating spheres, Still not really sure what I wanted to do. I did some uh, spheres with boxes subtracted from them. Finally, this, I started getting something I liked. I started twisting the repeating boxes, and rotating them, and I added this engraving line pattern on the ground. Uh, sort of like scratches just to add some detail and texturing. So then rotating these boxes as the map goes along created this cool twisting pattern and then mirroring them I had this great, I think it almost looks like a helix. Uh, this this was my map design. Very happy with this, uh, this result. Creates a very cool uh, repeating but not quite it never quite repeats the same way. It has different interlo interlapping periods. So then I started adding the details to the map here. Uh, I didn't like the way that it cut completely through, so I changed it to limit it. So it looks back like the scratch marks again. Changing the limit here of how far it sort of etches into the surface. And here we go. I got, I got an amount I'm, I'm happy with. All right, I've started working on a material system. I just improved the ambient occlusion here. And uh, now I've made the material function that'll return diffuse, specular, roughness, Fresnel, classic PBR material stuff. I've just set up a plain gray material. We're still just outputting diffuse ambient occlusion. There's no reflections yet. So now I'm taking the ray marching function and I'm putting it in its own function so that we can just ray trace the scene whenever we want. This function will just return the distance and material hit. And it'll return the view distance if nothing was hit. So then uh, we're going to start rendering the eyes. So we need to initialize the eyes array variables in the game logic. So I'm setting up the initialization here. We're just going to make sure they're set to all zero. And then I have some eye spawning code down below here that uh, we'll check and it'll spawn in eyes as the player walks in through the map. So we just set up the eyes with positions just so that we can render them. So now I've, I've set up a basic eye rendering. I'm doing it separately from the regular ray marching, but that's that's having some issues. You, my, you didn't see, but when the screen went all black there, my GPU just crashed. I had an infinite for loop. And uh, now you can see I'm having some lag. Uh, I, I'm just having issues with doing this separately. I thought it would be faster. So I have some planes here rendering, supposed to be rendering where the eyes should be. 
I thought doing this separately from the regular distance function and just uh, doing the eyes on their own would reduce the number of texture reads, but I'm obviously having issues with my for loop and function iterating. So at the end of the day, I, I ended up just deciding to just put the eyes in the distance function. So here we're, to reduce the number of texture reads, I'm just caching the eye based off the position. And here you can see those spheres, those are the eyes popping in, spawning in as you walk through. <laughs> so it's, I've just put in a red material for them now. It's just funny to me how easy that was compared to doing its own ray tracing function. So now I'm uh, going to do a proper material system, improve the rendering. I'm doing super sample anti-aliasing right now. I just included the multi-sampling and I'm comparing some samples in paint right now so you can see the, the anti-aliasing is definitely taking effect. You can see the pixels are... Uh, they have uh, some interpolation and blending. They aren't completely flat one, one to the other. So now I'm going to start programming reflections. Uh, we just separated that ray tracing function, so it's going to be pretty easy. We just call that. Uh, I'm going to do basic Fresnel, where I just scale the uh, strength of the reflection based off the dot product of the view ray and the normal. So you can he see here we got a nice reflection of the background, and it, and uh, I'm, I, I wasn't sure how I wanted to do the Fresnel, so I'm testing, cutting off the Fresnel here at different values. I'm just sort of going through them to test it. I found a system I was happy with. So now I've started working on the actual eye rendering. I've added some little purple skin around the eyes. You can see here. I'm going to start experimenting with some cylinder tentacles coming out the back of it to make them actually look like evil eyes. So here you can see a, a little bug in the uh, process. We've got something like tentacles now though. They're pretty plain and repeating, so I'm going to add some distortion and some waviness. And yet now you can see their uh, tentacles are waving. So I just made a few more adjustments to the skin. Uh, so these eyes are basically going to be the targets that you shoot at. The red part is going to be the hitbox. Now I've started working on actual uh, gameplay and UI. You can see now the circular crosshair in the middle of the screen. I've made the color dynamic based off the background behind it, so it's always visible. And I'm adding the first spell to the game now, teleport or blink. When you press the right mouse button, it will just blink you forward. Uh, there's no collision detection or anything, so you're just able to teleport through objects. You can see here, I think this is going to be vital for traversing the map I made. Well, like, this helix pattern is cool. It's not the most easily traversable pattern just through jumping and walking, so having this teleport will be will be crucial. Now I've messed with doing a little animation when you teleport, making the screen warp a little bit. I wasn't happy with it. Uh, so I started working on doing hands, uh, basically just having a little player sprite to show that you're a wizard. I ended up settling on these claw and making them look like demon claws. Uh, I decided to go for more human color, keep it ambiguous. You could be a demon wizard, you could be a human wizard. And I added a little finger wobble to show when the animation is ready. You can see now when I cast teleport, the fingers stop wobbling. Uh, I decided I needed a good uh, icon of when the spell was ready to cast, so now you can see there's this pink orb that shows when the teleport is ready. And I'll probably do a little animation there. Now, I've added a bit more styling to that teleport orb. I made it a bit more subtle purple swirls. Gave it a nice little effect. And then I moved on to working on the lightning orb. 
So for the lightning, I just want to do a simple branching lines effect. I started messing with this. I got something that looked more like a snowflake than actual lightning. Uh, but it did, create, it did create a cool effect. was able to easily add a little animation. After tweaking a bit, I got a, a flashing effect like lightning that I liked. And I colored it blue, and there we go. I had my lightning orb effect. So then I decided I wanted to do some culling. So the green boxes are where the arms and the orbs are being rendered. Outside they aren't. I decided to just do this little optimization because it was a good bit of code running to render the orbs and the hands. It wasn't super expensive, but I thought just why not do some cheap, cheap box culling. So then I've started working on the lightning bolt cast. So you can see that white box on the screen is the lightning bolt shooting out, or at least I'm starting to program it. So you can see I started shaping it, and I added in the same lightning animation from the lightning orb. I wasn't really sure what size of the beam I wanted to do, so I started I started changing around with different sizes. Found something I liked, felt that it fit well with the hand, and now I've worked on implementing the actual logic. So you can see the number here on the screen is the number of lightning casts. I'm just sort of debugging, counting, and now I've set up actual ray tracing. So when you shoot at the eyes, it hits the eyes and it adds to the counter and kills them. So this is like actual main part of the game logic now implemented. It's just simple. Ray trace forward if it hits an eye, then delete that eye. So in the process of this, I found a little bug. You can see here it's not detecting the hits. It took me way too long to figure out what this was. It was pretty obvious. On the view side, on the rendering side, I add an offset to the Y to move the player's head up. And in the ray tracing for the lightning, I wasn't doing that. So I just added this little Y offset, and boom, there we go, it was fixed. Very easy to do. I, I should have realized that right away when I was programming it. I decided to experiment with a better font using a handmade SDF. I just decided it was too much work and just went back to using the uh, pixelated font. So then I, I implemented actual proper spawning for the eyes. You can see it now spawns them throughout the map in different positions, not just in a straight line. Uh, this was a tiny change and it made a massive improvement. You can see I found some bugs though with it spawning eyes into the uh, map. So I, I ended up adding some code that repels them from the map. So then I've started adding uh, an animation for when the eyes die. Right now I'm just testing, so when you shoot an eye, it makes the whole area around the eye light up with lightning, just to test it. Now I fixed it, so it's just the eye. Just once again, I reused the same lightning animation that was uh, used for the hand orb effect before. And I figured that uh, the eyes hit by lightning should burn up in like a char. So I added a little dark blackening effect at the end of the dying animation. You can see there, it either looks like them burning up or them getting sucked back into the void. Now I've started working on the death system in the death screen. So to start here, when the player's Y position goes past a threshold, like you fall off the map, it'll trigger a red death screen here. On the screen, I'm going to display some scores and stats, like how much how many kills you got, how many times you casted the lightning strike, so that you can calculate your accuracy. I added a little space bar here so that you can restart. You hold space and it fills that bar. So now you can see the eyes are represented by a little icon. So I don't actually have text or font rendering, so the way I'm representing the number of lightning casts and number of evil eyes is with little procedural icons that I'm programming. Here you can see I'm making the lightning bolt icon. And then I'm just going to show the time to show you how quickly you were able to do it. And now the, the map is procedural and infinite, so it will more just let you calculate like how fast you were killing the eyes. I think the main thing is like you could calculate number of eyes killed divided by lightning casts to give you your accuracy. So now here we can see the 
screen is effectively made. If we go through the map, shoot up some eyes, get a score, and die, here we have our score displayed. Well, now that our player can shoot at the eyes, we need our eyes to shoot at the player, and since we have our death screen, it's perfect. So I'm creating a system now for detecting the eyes shooting lasers at the player. I'm going to make it just color the screen red when the player is getting shot by the eyes. So you can see here, when I go visible to the eyes, it just colors the screen red. Just a simple system where it sends a ray trace out to the player. So then I've started making an actual animation and a little highlight effect like a lens flare when the player is getting shot by the laser. I was originally, I was trying to do something with dot product and then maybe the dot product of like the view tangent to create a diamond effect. That's a lot of work though. I just ended up deciding to just convert the 3D position to screen space position and then use the XY position of that screen space position. That allowed me to make a, a variety of shapes. That's how most games do it. So I ended up tweaking a little circle shape, doing a little box shape, diamond shape. I settled on creating like a stretched out diamond, as you can see there, that stretches out the points. Then I created a lens flare that you can see here goes across the edge of the screen. I ended up adding this other effect to it where it sort of has a circle cut out of a circle. It, can, it kind of looks like a moon. It creates a ring effect when you look straight at it. Now there's some rendering optimizations I can do. Uh, I'm going to wrap the world in a bounding box so that it limits the ray tracing view distance. I'm messing around with that, but you can see there's some bugs that's cutting it off either at the wrong spot or it's moving it with the camera, which it shouldn't. So I'm fixing up that function. It's basically just ray tracing a box. And there we go. And then I can apply a similar thing to the eyes, where close to the eyes we have the full eye distance function that has all the details, and then far away we replace it with just a simple shape. So this improves the uh, distance function. Now I've started adding the launch options that will be provided when you start the game. The player will be able to change these options of the game, like field of view, view quality, crosshair size, etc. So then I just set these up via define constants. And I'm just configuring now how the view quality actually scales and relates to view distance and the ray marching surface precision, the epsilon. You got to configure them so that you have the right amount of steps to meet the epsilon and view distance, the surface precision and view distance. So now we have our specular reflections before just reflecting the background. Now we're actually going to reflect it. Instead of just reflecting off the surface normal, we're going to generate random bumps using the tangent, bitangent, and normal, and reflect off that to create glossy reflections similar to path tracing. So now I'm just working on the dithering method. The, the dithering really makes the difference of whether or not the reflections look like a cartoon pattern or whether or not they actually look like I, uh, reflections. So ideally, a nice dither pattern is low discrepancy. It changes, it doesn't quite repeat the same values. I ended up settling on this quasi-random R2 hash. It has the properties I'm looking for. Combined with super sampling here, you can see you pretty much get proper reflections with only a slight bit of noise. Now we're going to do proper scene reflections. We're not just going to reflect the background, we're going to reflect the scene. 
This is pretty easy since we already have our ray marching function. We just call that with the reflection ray. And if it hits something, we light and shade that instead of the background. Now doing this, I, I set it up with specular shading at the beginning. I wasn't sure if I wanted this. Here you can see the basic reflections off the ground. It's, it's kind of hard to see. I'm going to lower the diffuse so that you can see more of the specular. Bit too dark. You do need a bit of diffuse so that the pillars are reflected themselves. Oh yeah, and there you can see the pillars blocking the background and then being reflected themselves. Those are some nice reflections. Oh, and those glowing red eyes look so good. Now that we have these uh, rough reflections, it really adds some new, new options to the material system. And like I said, I wasn't sure if I wanted to light this with specular and diffuse. I decided the reflections are just going to be lit by ambient occlusion diffuse. And finally, we're replacing this placeholder skybox. I'm making a proper star field right now, making the stars a bit smaller, maybe changing the pattern a little bit, adding some coloring. Then uh, I'm redoing this nebula. We're still doing it with the Veronoi, but changing it up. So you see we start here with some simple Voronoi blobs. I'm going to add some higher frequency details to give it some more uh, of a dirty look. So that's, that's a bit too high frequency. I'm going to lower that. That's about just right. That's a nice mix of some... Uh... And now we're finally adding coloring, which I think is crucial. It just makes it look so much better. I'm just doing a simple red, green, blue coloring where it fa fades through red, green, blue. And so then this background shifts as you walk through the map. So what I'm doing is, is I'm adjusting the coloring and how it shifts it as you walk along the Z position of the map. I'm pretty nice. This also gives it an effect of like uh, northern lights, especially with that green. I'm also changing the stars because they also shift as you walk along the map. So like the... It, the stars are randomly generated. It should technically make some sort of like constellations. They should change as you walk along the map. So then finally, since we're having these ra uh, random colored nebulas, uh, I think the map needs to be colored appropriately. So I'm, I'm adding a ambient light function that calculates the color of the current nebulas and then we're going to light the map using that. So we're just replacing the constant constant ambient light color with this function. You can see here now that that immediately looks pretty good, adding that green tint to the map. So what I noticed here is it was tinted red when the nebula was actually green. So I found it was a little bit bugged, and I realized I needed to add an offset to account for the way I was uh, calculating the background compared to that function. So now you can see it's colored properly green. It's really nice. So now with all that worked out, I'm just finally tweaking the materials because having it all come together with the background, the rough reflection system, uh, tweak some stuff so that it all looks nice together. I gave the eyes a much more, uh, I don't know how to describe it, artificial look. Just doing some final tweaks of the color and the style. I ended up on pretty much the same thing I started with, a, uh, a dark purple. I decided to not make it too dark because I still wanted the eyes to be visible. Oh, and those reflections of the lightning just look so good.
So here, here you can see the uh, final materials I settled with. Now all that's left are some small tweaks. I just wanted to change some stuff like the player jumping, the rate that you could teleport and shoot. Change some of those difficulty options, you know, it, they're small but they make quite the difference of how fast you need to shoot to respond to the eyes before they shoot you. I ended up on a nice scale where zero difficulty is like target practice where you don't need to worry about the eyes, they can't shoot you. And 100 is like hell, where they basically instantly kill you as soon as you go in range, but it's still viable and possible. At the end, I was pretty happy. So this is this is the Mana Plane. It's not a serious game. Like I said at the beginning, it's an experiment to uh, test out what you can do with just making a game in GLSL. So this is available on itch.io and my website zalos.com. You can also download the source code and I'll of course have the links to all that in the description. I hope it was entertaining. Thanks for watching.